This is Dollars to Donuts with Steve Portugal. Hi, and welcome to Dollars to Donuts, the podcast where we talk with the people who lead user research in their organization. I'm Steve Portugal. If you are curious about developing your team's user research superpowers, or if you want a partner in discovering and acting on new insights, get in touch at portugal.com. You can also buy my book, Interviewing Users, from Rosenfeld Media and Amazon. Alex Wright is the Director of Research at Etsy in Brooklyn, New York. He is a researcher and a designer and a writer. His most recent book is called Cataloging the World, Paul Otley and the Birth of the Information Age. He's also a graduate faculty member at the School of Visual Arts MFA program in Interaction Design. It's a real treat to have him today on Dollars to Donuts. Well, Alex, thanks very much for being with us, and uh, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. Oh, hi, Steve. Thanks for having me. So let's just start very broadly, uh, as we do, and, and have you tell us about Etsy and what's your role there and what that's about. Sure. So I started at Etsy about a year and a half ago, and I was the first full-time researcher hired at Etsy. Um, not that Etsy had never done any research before, but typically that had involved uh, consultants or contractors, or we had a product manager at one point who had previously been a researcher. So there was some level of research going on, but it, the company made a decision that they they wanted to put more of a focused effort around doing you know, especially UX research. I think there was a feeling that um, you know Etsy had gotten very good at experimentation and A-B testing and had a pr- pretty... Uh, a pretty well-developed approach to data analytics and experimentation, but I think that there was a feeling that there was something missing and they wanted to create uh, more space for qualitative research. And so uh, so I came in as sort of the uh, sort of a lone wolf researcher <laughs> about a year and a half ago, but in the period since then, we've been able to, to uh, grow the team. We're now about uh, a 10-person research team doing a combination of both UX research and market research, as well as some market trends analysis. So we're kind of a um, kind of a hybrid team, but you know, with certainly Etsy's a very product-oriented culture, so we tend to um, you know strongly emphasize UX research, but we are starting to do more marketing and trying to figure out how we can support that more effectively by doing more market research kind of stuff too. So. Before I ask you about that, maybe you could just explain what Etsy is in case anybody somehow doesn't know. Sure. So Etsy is a marketplace for handmade and vintage products. It's been around for almost 10 years now. And we are now a marketplace with over a million sellers. We, in 2013, uh, over a billion dollars worth of products flowed through the marketplace. And our, you know, our business is fairly straightforward. We, you know, it's a, it's a marketplace. We take a small commission on uh, products that are sold on the site. And then we have a few other revenue streams like, um, we have some promoted listings. We sell like um, shipping labels. You can have pre-printed, and uh, that sort of thing. But generally, we're, we try to be a very—it's a very transparent kind of business model. We're basically a marketplace where you buy and sell things that are mostly made by by artisans and, and artists. So. so I may be uh, joining two things that don't connect. But when you mm-hmm. say that Etsy is a very product-focused company, and that's why mm-hmm. UX research is sort of what's being done, does that have to do with the business that Etsy is in? Well, I think, you know, the interesting thing about Etsy is it really grew very organically. It started as, really the whole company started as essentially a mailing list for the, the founder, a guy named Rob Kalin, was an artist, and he had some artist friends, and he started, uh, you know, originally kind of a mailing list just to, so he could tell his friends about his art shows, and then they would tell each other about their shows, and then eventually it turned into sort of a bulletin board, kind of Craigslist type thing. And then it just sort of, grew organically from there. So I think the interesting thing about Etsy is it's it was very much um, you know a, a marketplace that was created by the community of sellers in a, in a very real way. And it wasn't like there was somebody, you know, some MBA with a business plan to build this marketplace for handmade and vintage goods. I mean, the market kind of like created itself almost. And so there's always been this strong focus at the company on, um, you know, trying to create uh, to, you know, a platform for sellers to to grow their businesses and to you know be able to you know for, for creative people and artists to be able to find a livelihood by reaching a, a global audience on the on the internet. But there's never been a lot of like marketing. I mean, the put the emphasis has always been on creating the platform and the tools, 
um, and, and doing that in a very uh, collaborative way with sellers. I spent a lot of time talking to sellers. We have historically spent maybe less time talking to buyers, although I think that's really changing now. But um, the point is when I say it's a product company, really it's because that's the, the dynamic that really led to the creation of the company was very much this bottom up kind of impetus. Um, and now we're at a point where as the company is growing, we're starting to see more international expansion and we're realizing that we probably need to be a little more intentional about how we talk about Etsy and what it is. So a lot of the research we're doing now is sort of figuring out what the brand is or should be, um, figuring out how that relates to the product experience. But but at the end of the day, you know, we're a company that's very much driven by, has traditionally been driven by organic growth and not so much by, you know, big marketing campaigns or customer acquisition strategies. Like it's been a very, very much like our emphasis on trying to, is, has been on trying to build a good product and with, you know, the assumption that if you build something that works well, people will want to use it. And so far that's, you know, has served us well so far, but we're, again, we're starting to take a little bit of a harder look at, at you know, how we could be more intentional about, about growth going forwards. So at the, at the top, you started to describe, um, you know, more of a market research piece coming in. Is that, is mm -hmm. that correct? That's right. Yeah. So, you know, we are doing more marketing, especially overseas. I mean, the kind of organic growth that we've seen in the U.S. is a little harder to replicate overseas, although we are seeing actually nice growth in, in some markets, um, especially the U.K. right now. But, um, you know, it's partly that we're, you know, we feel like we want to do more uh, sort of, you know, tell, explaining what the Etsy, what Etsy is, you know, trying to figure out how to contextualize that in different countries and, um, and doing more digital marketing, you know, things like SEO and, um, you know, more traditional kind of digital campaigns. And, uh, you know, we're going through a process now sort of looking at the brand and trying to figure out how we could articulate a clearer um, sense of what Etsy is. I mean, it was never really defined, you know, in a, as a brand in a kind of MBA sense. And so it's something that now it's kind of, you know, been defined by other people to some extent, like the experiences people have with it. So we're trying to figure out where the gap is between the way sort of we understand Etsy internally and the way that our buyers and sellers seem to understand it. We've done some, you know, we've been doing quite a bit of research sort of like, brand positioning research and survey research to try to get at like what I mean at a very high level maybe to oversimplify that research where you know we see internally Etsy sees itself as a very uh, socially conscious values driven company we're a B corporation which means we're um, you know we really manage ourselves um, using what we call a stakeholder model as opposed to a shareholder model so we're not in other words Etsy is not just in the business of trying to generate maximal profits every quarter. You know, we see ourselves as having an equally weighted mission between, you know, yes, we'd like to be profitable, but we also want to serve the community of sellers. We want to be environmentally responsible. Um, we want to support the local community. And so we do a lot of kind of outreach and things like that. So it's kind of, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, take that understanding that we have internally and then look, mapping that against the way Etsy is seen maybe in the marketplace, which is more as kind of like this place you can go to get quirky, you know, unusual products, which is, which is true, but is only part of the story. So those are some of the things we're trying to look at is what is that, you know, how could we do a better job of sort of conveying what Etsy is really about and how much would that matter in terms of, you know, customer behavior. So those are some of the kinds of things we're, we're looking at. I want, I want to follow up without sort of putting you on the spot with Etsy specifically, but I, I think you've described a dynamic that is very common in a lot of organizations. So maybe we could just speak about the role of research and just, and how we think about these topics, um, you know, in internally we stand for something and here's what we're about and here's what we're putting out in the world. And, uh, out in the world, there's a perception or a sort of, uh, you know, a value proposition attached to us. And in, in the example you described, they're not, those aren't at odds, but they emphasize different pieces. Mm -hmm. And I, I, that to me, I, you know, I'm nodding my head as you describe that. That's very common and, and often seems that, that good research can help, you know, uncover that gap and, and maybe start to, to make the connection. But I wonder, is there, what does one try to do when there's a difference internally? Are we trying to, do you try to change the perception or do you try to change the identity or is there a? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I would say that's really a, a dialogue that we're going through just as we speak. I mean, I think the open, one big open question is, you know, how important is it to convey sort of values and the sense of social mission, even though, you know, that's a lot of the reason a lot, you know, a big part of the reason a lot of people, myself included, you know, want, want to work here. Um, you know, the, the open question is, does that core, does, 
is there sort of a segment of buyers that you might call sort of socially conscious consumers where that's an important part of the message that actually drives their behavior. And that's the research that we're really just sort of embarking on. I mean, we're, we're starting to get some signals around that. Um, and looking at the whole kind of spectrum of people who come to Etsy, you know, trying to get more, a little more sophisticated about the way we segment them and understanding, you know, broadly, what are the sort of attitudinal segments that, you know, when we look at people come to the marketplace, I mean, we have some people who would come in via, say, a Google search because they saw a Google product listing ad and may not even really know what Etsy is. They just saw this interesting thing and they bought it. And, um, you know, that's a very different kind of interaction than somebody who, you know, is really engaged with the Etsy community and, you know, follows people and, you know, has friends on the site and makes it more of a daily habit and is more sees a more of a kind of connection there. You know, those are both I think important constituencies to understand, but from a marketing point of view, the question is, which of those audiences do you want to grow? And uh, that's where I think the brand comes into it. Like, where does your brand sort of go, and how does it? What are the gaps between, you know, the way you might, the, the way your brand is manifesting in the marketplace now, and the way that it maybe could if you were trying to align with, the, you know, growing a certain segment? But there's still open questions around, you know. There's some other sort of interesting hypotheses floating around about that. Like, for example, a lot of a lot of our audience is women, the you know, vast majority. Um, you know, we're see, looking at questions of you know, kind of our core audience is a lot of like millennials and sort of younger audience. We're kind of looking at you know, are there other you know, sort of adjacent audiences we could be growing? Um, and we're sort of in the process of like doing some more more precise segmentation and then taking that segmentation and then trying to map that to behavioral signals um, in the data. So when we do a big like brand survey, we can actually, you know, map the responses back to if they're current users anyway, we can map them back anonymously to our, um, to our data source, you know, to our internal traffic logs and see if are there interesting signals about purchase behavior, or, you know, things that we could then use to sort of type people into these segments and do maybe do a better job of creating a, an optimized experience for them. So. And all that grouping is happening for both buyers and sellers. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. And so for sellers, we know a lot more about sellers than buyers. I mean, Etsy historically has been very close to the seller community. We have big, you know, big chunk of the companies out there constantly doing outreach and events, and you know, we talk to them a lot. Um, but we do have like a sell. We have a, a kind of more established seller segmentation of. You know, we have like, you know, a number of what we call top sellers who tend to be the most successful. You know, sellers on Etsy who tend to take it very seriously as a business. It's basically they, this is their livelihood is selling on Etsy. They're, you know, a number of people who fit that, you know, that description. Um, and then we have like a, you know, a long tail of people where it's more of a hobby or they have some a collection of some vintage items or they just like to, you know, do some knitting or make jewelry in their part time. So there's also like, a, there's also sort of the, the part time audience. So we might look at it from a, you know, from a pure kind of data analytics point of view, we might look at that and say, oh, we have like five buckets of sellers. We have brand new sellers and we have these kind of like, you know, um, you know, kind of small scale sellers and then medium and big and then sort of super top sellers. But I think what that misses is the attitudinal dimension of, you know, okay, for some of these sellers, like it's really just a hobby and they're, they're perfectly happy to be in that, you know, what might look like from one point of view, less successful a less successful business, but then there are other people maybe in that segment of, um, you know, lower sales who really have an aspiration to grow their business. But on, you know, from a data analytics point of view, they might look like the same people, but I think trying to deepen your understanding of the, you know, the attitudes and the expectations that some of these people have then gets you to a point where you could then, you know, target, you know, those different types of sellers with different kinds of messages. Like, you know, do you want to grow your business or do you want to just get better at, you know, at knitting or something, you know, what is your intention? You know, is it, are you doing this for fun or is it a serious business? So we're trying to get more, this is, I think, where this kind of research can really inform not just the product development, but also looking in more of a sort of service design direction of looking at some of the programs and um, communication and the outreach we do with sellers, I think, can really be informed by this combination of sort of data analytics and, um, and more um, attitudinal market research. So. You, you're describing kind of a yes and with the two methods as opposed to one is better than the other. I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, that's a, really the, the approach we've been trying to take is we work, I mean, we have a pretty good data analytics team and uh, we also have a data science team that works on things like personalization. And, you know, we try to really um, avoid having it seem like a, uh, like an either or decision about like, do you do qualitative research or, you know, 
market research or do you do uh, data analysis? Like we see those things as very complementary, and you know there is some there are points of sort of friction there. But you know I think in some ways, you know data some aspects of data analytics and A/B testing and experimentation have gotten sufficiently sophisticated that they've displaced the need for certain kinds of more traditional usability research. But um, I think that's fine. You know, I think we're increasingly trying to use, especially more qualitative UX research methods to um, focus more on sort of hypothesis generation, on looking for sort of the, the white space opportunities for new products and less in this kind of like QA mode of, you know, how can we optimize the checkout process? Because we have computers that can do that now. So. If I was thinking about, uh, you know, kind of taking advantage of, you know, good data analytics and good qualitative research, I, and it, well, I'll say for me, historically, it has been one leads into the other, and that's mm -hmm. because I have a foot in one camp. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm often coming up with questions for another you know, set of tools to answer, or I'm taking uh, questions that have emerged. Um, but the way you're talking about it, it makes me think that you could do something that I haven't got to do yet, which is sort of start at the beginning and say, we have these two pieces and we're going to kind of use them together and maybe mm -hmm. ping, ping pong them to answer an initial question. Yeah. I mean, that's certainly where we're trying to take things. Um, you know, I would say just to be transparent, you know, I'd say it's a, it's a process. Like certainly when I first got here, it was much, and even today, it's still some of this where, you know, often you'll have a product manager or designer, you know, has questions and they'll go to find people who they think can help answer their questions. So they might go to a UX researcher or they might go to a data analyst and there certainly have been cases where the product manager, you know, with all good intentions, might just go to both of those people. But the result is that, you know, the data analysis and the UX research get um, brought together sort of downstream, you know. And so what we're trying to do is really make sure that that collaboration happens as upstream as, as possible. So a couple of things we've done sort of to that end, we recently um, established a couple of cross-functional teams, what we're calling, um, we have what's called a buyer insights team and a seller insights team. Um, also something called a marketing insights team. And the idea is that those are cross-functional teams made up of data analysts and researchers who really get together regularly and um, just keep each other abreast of inbound requests for, you know, for data or for research and then try to figure out how they could um, complement each other's work. And it often comes up where, you know, we'll be doing a piece of research and the analyst will say, well, we, you know, we haven't been tracked. I'll give you, here's a, maybe I'll give you a more concrete example. Um, we were doing some work around uh, the sold orders process. What happens when a when an item gets sold on Etsy? Like what happens? So the way we did that was to, you know, our initial thought was to go and do some in depth some field research. So we actually had uh, a couple of researchers went out and with the product managers and uh, went out and did a bunch of field studies with Etsy sellers, where we went out to their studios or their, um, you know, some of them work at home, some of them work in dedicated studio spaces. But we really wanted to just follow them through the process of, you know, what happens when this thing sells because it becomes sort of invisible to us at that point. Um, and what we found was that a surprising number of uh, sellers, as soon as they sold the order, the first thing they did was print out the confirmation on a piece of paper. And several sellers actually then used that printed artifact as their main workflow. They would then a lot, of, some of them would have like a big, like, um, kind of bulletin board in their space, and they would literally like tack up these, you know, these printed order order receipts, and use that to manage like the shipping, you know, their 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 process of packaging things, shipping them, and so forth. So what we realized was that it, I mean, the qualitative research suggested that this print artifact was actually a pretty important part of the process, and it had just been a total afterthought. Like nobody had ever spent any time thinking about what that looked like or how it was used or sort of is it the right information on that page that you use. I mean, it just didn't look like much, right? So um, as a result of that, we then went back and talked to the data analyst team and asked them, did they have any, you know, we see, we're seeing this in qualitative research. Looks like a lot of people printing this thing out. Is that a, is that true? And they went and realized that actually we had never been tracking that. Nobody had ever thought to, you know, track how many times this page was being printed out. So they added uh, some code to fire an event when that uh, order form got printed out and they found that sure enough, you know, significant percentage of people were printing it out. And so that led to the insight that, oh, actually we need to really focus on that, you know, that print experience and, and understanding that workflow, which also led to some other insights about, you know, how we could optimize that, that process for people. So, so just one example of where I think, mm -hmm. you know, qual qualitative research and quantitative analysis can really complement each other. And I like one aspect of your story where, um, you know, maybe it would be ideal if, 
product managers as you you know new to engage the different services that they have access to um, but you know as a response what you guys are doing is saying you know we're all going to talk so that we're we're in touch with each other so you're not asking other people to change you're just um, you know you're taking everyone's taking care of everyone well that's yeah I mean we figure it's it's better for us just to talk to each other and rather than try to like impose some process you know where we have like some you know account manager you have to talk to before you can talk to an analyst or a you know researcher we're just saying we're much flatter sort of organization so it just feels like just in trying to create forums where that kind of um you know cross-functional collaboration can happen seems, seems to be working so far i mean it's still we're still sort of experimenting with it figuring out what's the right how often should these groups get together how do they really tactically work together but so far it's, it's gotten some some decent results so. it's just nice to hear uh you know quant and qual to use those horrible words uh right. you know, kind of framed as allies uh, mm -hmm. it's a really nice aspect of your story yeah i mean that's really the approach we're trying to take and partly it's that you know i, I think it's also in kind of an interesting position where i think for more some more you know established companies that have had stronger like research disciplines or you know more established market research or even ux research i think that you know the growth of um you know to use another cliche big data you know data analysis is has really, um, you know, I think emerged in the last few years and started to challenge some of those ways of doing things. We're saying at Etsy, we were coming really from the reverse position where we were had a very developed data culture and almost no real qualitative research happening where we've been trying to create the space for research sort of in the opposite direction. So, so it's not like we were really giving up anything. It's more just like trying to find the, the open spaces where we can maybe add some value. And that sounds like it's part of just the overall growth that you, you mentioned up front where there was a history of this work at the company. Um, it's kind of in the, it's in the roots, but, but the decision to hire you was you know, putting a stake in the ground and saying, this is, we're going to commit to this in a more formal, deliberate way. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. And I think a lot of the impetus that for that came out of the, uh, the design group. I mean, technically research, the research team is part of the product design organization. And I think a lot of the designers felt like they just weren't getting a, a rich enough picture of, of user interactions to make good decisions. They were just, everything was being very, um, you know, adjudicated with data and they felt like there was some, something missing. So there was mm -hmm. kind of, you know, a, a design, you know, a lot of the impetus for creating my role and then continuing to grow it has come from the, you know, within the product design group. Although we actually, we really work across a number of different functions now, but that's, that's where we live at, at the moment anyway. What has been that uh, trajectory from, you know, the lone wolf, I think you described your initial stage, mm -hmm. um, to, you know, to having a team? How's, how's the team grown? Yeah, so it's been a combination of, um, you know, recruiting folks from the outside. So when I first started, you know, I ran, you know, for several months, I basically just ran a series of studies on projects that seemed like they would benefit from research. And then pretty soon it became, got to the point where, you know, there was more, I didn't have the bandwidth to do all the studies people were asking me to do. So I brought in um, a contract researcher who I'd worked with in the past, a woman named Jill Fruchter, um, who's been great. I'd worked with her in my previous job at the at the New York Times. And so she contracted with us for a bit. And then at the beginning of last year, we brought her on full time. Um, also, there was another person uh, already here at Etsy, um, my colleague, uh, Roxy Carpin, who was uh, had been a market researcher sort of in a previous life. And she was in the member operations part of the company doing and was doing some level of survey work like we do we have been doing these member surveys and she was kind of running that but she was really wanting to get into more back into more of a um a research role and she's more of a quantitative survey researcher so um so she joined the team and then as the year went you know as the year went on we just started to see demand grow and we were able to make the case to bring in um more researchers so currently we have about four dedicated ux researchers we also recently just hired our first quantitative UX researcher, which is a really interesting role, which I don't think there are too many of them, too many people out there in the world with that job title. Um, the ones I've been able to find all work at Google and Facebook, but um, but we're, we've created a role like that, which is kind of basically somebody doing survey research exclusively for the product organization. So looking at you know, things like customer satisfaction and um, you know feature level kind of feedback mechanisms and, um, and things like that. And then we also have uh, so recently another person joined the team who was an internal transfer to do more market trends analysis. So looking at more, you know, less about sort of individual user interactions or understanding, um, you know, the SE audience particularly, but more looking at kind of macro trends, you know, in um, in the market and in uh, sort of the e-commerce space that could 
it may, we're hoping to do more sort of um, forward-looking research that might look at you know the future of say in-person payments or you know shopping at craft fairs or things like that and trying to look at um, you know, can we put out some more um, do some more like you know long-term research that might yield product ideas down the line or might just lead to other kinds of um, opportunities that we don't quite know what they are yet. So. So that's roughly what the team was. We also, interesting, one other person on the team was another internal transfer. Um, we have a dedicated research engineer, which I feel incredibly lucky to have. Um, we have an engineer on the team who had previously done some research. Uh, he'd been at DoubleClick for a while, and he was really interested, and so he kind of raised his hand, and he's sort of on a permanent assignment from the engineering team, so he does a lot of our tooling. Um, we, For example, we wanted to do a, a mobile diary study recently, and he built a little... Uh, uh, diary study tool that allowed sellers to like um, uh, to allow us to basically collect input from sellers through, for example, phone message, you know, voicemail or email or text, and it could all get kind of consolidated into one thing. So he does a lot of that kind of like ad hoc tooling work, and then also some some level of data analysis, um, querying. If we want to do a particularly targeted recruit for a particular kind of buyer or seller, he can like help us write the SQL code, the SQL queries to like really pull that exact profile people from the, um, you know, from our database. So, uh, so that's been a really great experience. So first for me to, to work with somebody in really, I think you know, in a dedicated engineering role, I think it's something that I think a lot of in-house research teams struggle with is getting um, uh, support from engineers to like build, do the tooling that they need. And I think that's, I would just um, offer my uh, strong endorsement of that that set up. I think we're really lucky to have somebody like that. And it's made our team much more effective, effective and allowed us to do things that otherwise we probably have to hire vendors to do. So, um, so that's been working really well. You know, if the metaphor, uh, when you started, it was lone wolf and, and now you're describing, I, I mean, a really strong and diverse team that's come together in this, this, this way, is there a metaphor for kind of who you are collectively now? Ah, oh, God, what is, do we have an animal metaphor? <laughs> um, you know, or any metaphor. Right. Um, I think we're still, I mean, we're all, we're a pretty young team, you know, even though we're still, I mean, some of us are, you know, younger than others, but, um, you know, we're, we're still gelling, I think, as a team, you know, I'd say you could say we're, we're a little bit of, uh, you know, a pack of um, maybe wild puppies or something. We're still trying to get a little more disciplined and coordinated, but um but we're doing pretty well. I mean, I think it's a great team, and I feel very fortunate um, that you know that we managed to get a good a good mix of qualitative and quantitative researchers coming together. But we're still, you know, it's, Etsy's still a you know a growing company. It's you know you can't exactly call it a startup now, but it's still pretty um, pretty entrepreneurial kind of culture. So everything's a little bit like kind of standing up in a boat. You know, we're still um, figuring it out as we go. I guess. Are there things that you do as the leader of the pack of puppies? Um, to to help the team gel, and maybe these are. I guess I'm probing around things that are. You described a lot about sort of how the work is getting done. Are there other things that, you know, that that maybe fall under the category of team building, given your culture and the things you work on? Yeah, I mean that's certainly becoming much more of what my role is now. I mean, I'm, I'm not really doing so much research these days. I'm more in you know sort of a general management role. Um, so a lot of what I, and a lot of my role is trying to. Uh, you know, work with internal stakeholders to figure out where the need is and make sure we're balancing, um, you know, the level of attention we're giving to different projects and that the team feels productively engaged in that. Um, you know, the way I see my role as, you know, the manager of this team is really trying to um, create a, a container that allows for some knowledge sharing to happen and for people to grow and develop and, you um, you know, and continue to progress along their own paths. Um, you know, we're trying to really avoid being too much the the research department. I mean, we're really trying to avoid getting too siloed. I've seen that happen in other organizations where, you know, you create this kind of cross-functional research team and then it, this starts to be seen as its own little, um, little island of, of insights. We're trying to really work in much more of what I would call a semi-embedded model where we have researchers who are, especially the UX researchers, really kind of live with the product teams. They actually sit with them. Um, not that they're, we have a researcher embedded with every product team, but generally we have like, you know, a small team that works with sellers primarily and a small team that works with buyers primarily. And they kind of, you know, live in those worlds, but they, you know, I would say that the research 
team is sort of like a secondary layer of container that, that allows us to just, you know, learn from each other and make sure that we're prioritizing things properly, but, um, but that we're staying, you know, close to the, I mean, at the end of the day, Etsy is a product company. We're not a research company. And so it's, I think it's very important that we align around what we do as an organization. Um, at the same time, you don't want to get too close to the subject as a researcher. So it's always like managing that tension a little bit. Like you want to be close enough that you're seen as a trusted partner and that you have some influence. At the same time, you don't want to go get so embedded that you just drink the Kool-Aid and lose your perspective and, you know, become, you know, biased in all kinds of ways. So we're constantly kind of trying to walk that tight. So I guess my job is sort of like helping people walk that tight rope a little bit, um, staying kind of, you know, one um, one foot in the product teams, but still keeping some cohesion and some ongoing dialogue happening as a, as a research team. So. That container needs to be porous to a certain extent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's interesting. I like, I like your, your description of the research department, you know, as you say it, I sort of, I see the sign with capital letters and I see kind right. of where they are in the, in the, in the office. Um, right. and, yeah. Up on some other floor. Yeah. yeah. With their lab and their lab coats on. And yeah, we try to try to avoid that. <laughs> I would hypothesize that 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 happens in organizations as a response to uh, to resistance. That uh, do you think that's right? That I think that's probably true. You know that that um, maybe in some cases it can be seen as like a you know a way of strengthening the practice or feeling you know of exerting more influence. Um, I just. You know, I, I get the argument. I feel I I, I think it, it, you know, there's no one right answer for this. I think it depends on the company. Etsy particularly is a very um, just flat and distributed company. I've worked in other organizations that were much more top down, hierarchical, where maybe something like a research department actually does make sense in that it maybe gives you a little more, um, you know, uh, s- status in the organization or something. If you have to like do a lot of like presentations to senior managers and you know, make things, you know, make your insights feel important because, you know, you have a big department behind them and a big budget. But, you know, with, at Etsy, it's really much more like product teams pretty much chart their own course. And I think you need to be like, a, you know, you need to adapt to that to that world. But I'm not certainly not saying that what works for Etsy would work for other companies. I'm not not sure it would. You know. That's, I think, an important observation, too, that, that I mean, you're, just because you're, you're getting now into how it is, how does this function of research exist within different kinds of teams throughout the organization? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it, 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 we tend to want uh, to know the single best practice for how to do that. But I think you're. Yeah, I've been trying to really, I mean, I've done some work talking to peers at other companies and trying to look at, you know, how does Google do it? How does Facebook do it? How does, you know, how does, so that company do it bigger and smaller companies? And there is no, there really is no one model. There's certainly some companies that have much more of the, um, centralized, you know, customer insights team model. My, my last company, the New York times was like that. Um, eBay is organized like that. Uh, Yahoo has been somewhat organized like that. And you know, that can work. I mean, and those are, I mean, my last company, was like analytics and research, market research and UX research were all sort of part of one function. Um, but there are other, you know, alternative models like Google appears to have like a very distributed research function where researchers really just exist sort of across the organization. And I think there's, my sense is that it's much more of a sort of um, informal community of practice there. Um, And then Facebook on the other end seems to have something more like what we have, which is market research and UX research in a a somewhat more departmentalized model within the product design group. So um, I'm always interested in, you know, hearing about what's working or not working. I think this is still, I think especially with you know, the growth of, in my, at least my sense is more and more companies are developing their in-house UX research capabilities and figuring out where that lives and how it relates to product and, and how it relates to market research. And it looks like these are all, I think, just interesting open questions that I think it would be, um, I think it's premature to, to claim that there's, you know, one true true way at this point. I think it's just a, an interesting thing to look at and see how it evolves over the, over the next few years. But I, I wish there were more of a... I wish I knew who to talk to. Like I'm kind of going out and often like trying to just make connections with people in other companies, but I feel like there's not really a, a great sort of um, forum for that conversation to happen like in the industry right now. I don't know where that is or where it could be, but I would love to see that that dialogue happening a little more. I think, well, you know, we would all benefit from it. Well, I think I'm glad you just put that out there and maybe by putting that out there, you know, that can, that can change. 
we won't solve it in you know in this conversation but i, mm-hmm. I think i think it's a good it's a good call out I, I, i'm having one of those moments where uh you know i've thought about when you think of a question you've you, you you've already heavily framed uh or maybe overframed and you know, as I'm thinking about speaking to you and thinking about sort of structural and, and departmental and organizational issues, um, you know, what what was underneath all that is kind of, I don't know, designing to overcome resistance. But mm-hmm. the more that you talk and I'm hearing more about um, maybe designing for efficacy or the, the, you're not talking about resistance, you're talking about sort of, you know, how to have impact. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, it's not like, you know, we've never encountered any resistance or anything. Like, certainly there's been, um, you know, stuff we've had to work with. Like, I think particularly when I was first starting, there was certainly, I think in some quarters, uh, let's say skepticism, but just unfamiliarity with, like, qualitative research methods and the value. And I think there was a bit of a default instinct to just, if there was a question or an alternative hypothesis, just to throw it into an experiment. Um, And I think it's been, you know, a learning process for the organization to figure out, like, when does that make sense and when could you um, maybe take a different approach to like really do the more qualitative exploration that might actually lead to a better experiment down the road. So, you know, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture of things like it's still, we're all still learning and kind of, you know, trying to, uh, you know, muddle through some of these questions a little bit, but I, but I think generally there's a, there's my, my sense is, you know, not to sound too self-serving, but I think there's growing interest in receptivity to, um, to research and seeing it as just a, another part of the toolkit that product managers and designers can can lean on. But um, but again, we're to really trying not to position it as an alternative to data analysis or anything. We just don't see that as a, a fruitful way to frame things. You know? What would you like to see it like in, I don't know, five years or something? Do you have kind of a, a, a goal state or a... Um, I mean, I guess my aspiration would be to get to, I mean, I think we're really at the point now of just getting to a certain level of competency with um, our product design and trying to take a more user-centered um, approach to the way we build and design and build products. And I think we're, we're making some good headway there. But I think that the bigger opportunity for Etsy is really looking at um, you know, a wider landscape of, of issues around, like there's this whole kind of complex ecosystem of buyers and sellers. And increasingly, we're also looking at um, sort of how manufacturing can enter into that. I think, you know, manufacturing sometimes sounds like kind of a dirty word, but, you know, the vast majority of manufacturers in the United States are like companies with four or fewer people. Um, and Etsy definitely sees like an opportunity to create more of a, um, uh, a, a more sustainable marketplace for small scale manufacturing to happen and try to figure out like basically people who have made things and maybe need some help, you know, Getting it, cre- you know, getting it built. We've certainly had what we've seen in some case, what we uh, have called internally the graduation problem, where an Etsy seller is making this handmade thing and they start getting so many orders that they can't keep up, and they might need some help, like with, um, you know, getting something produced. And uh, that's something where we feel like Etsy has a produ- potentially productive role to play in that. But it gets into more of like a service design kind of question, gets into um, you know questions around the whole manufacturing ecosystem and how could we do more, you know, I think it gets into questions of doing a combination of like service design, product design, and, you know, looking at sort of macroeconomic trends and how they could, you know, maybe reveal some opportunities in the marketplace for us to create new services. So that's where I sort of aspire to go is more in that, in that sort of direction. But I think for the moment, we're definitely just trying to get, make sure we're, um, you know, we've got our shoelaces tied and that we're you know, able to move forward in a reasonable way with doing, you know, fairly, fairly tactical product design. Is that what the is that where it leans heavily right now? Is is focused on the tactical? Well, I mean, I think we're doing um, the the general approach we're taking at the moment is, is sort of a portfolio approach where we're doing probably about seventy percent of our research is pretty tactical. About twenty percent is a little more longitudinal of trying to you know look at um, you know other kinds of questions that might lead to longer term product ideas like. Um, you know, for example, looking at the, uh, say, for, I mean, we know, for example, that a lot of people use Etsy to, like, plan weddings, right? So we we're very interested in doing, like, kind of a longitudinal study around that that might lead to some future um, product concepting. But there's nothing, like, really, I mean, we have, like, a registry product now, but um, but there's probably a lot of directions we could take that kind of, you know, that research could have, like, kind of potentially 
really interesting implications for the way we do merchandising and other features we might develop. So we try to do maybe about 20% of our research is a little more kind of long-term focused. And then about 10% were, and this is more of an aspiration at this point, but it's sort of an intention, is to do more um, sort of concept car research where we might do more, try to really take a few um, unexplored territories and really just do a piece of strategic research to see is there an opportunity around this space, you know, in the market. Like, for example, um, you know, if we wanted to look at um, doing something, say, around like families or, you know, DIY crafting or, um, you know, or alternatively looking at, um, you know, a brand new market that we haven't entered yet. So those are some of the, you know, a new vertical market or something like that. So I'm hoping that next year we'll carve out some portion of our time to really try to do those kinds of, um, you know, more kind of speculative research projects that might lead to a long-term project outcome. But, you know, the, ch the challenge is always balancing that kind of work against the, the here, you know, the, the here and now demands, which tend to threaten to overwhelm that kind of work pretty quickly. So that's something we're aspiring to, but we haven't done yet. <laughs> that uh, early on, you mentioned this, this brand work. Mm -hmm. uh, does that fit in the 70% tactical? Um, it's a good question. I mean, what I was saying was more, I guess, more in terms of product research. Um, yeah, the brand work is pretty important. I, I would say it's both tactical and strategic. I mean, it would certainly probably affect some brand marketing that we'll probably be doing at some point. Um, it's, it's filtering into some, uh, brand positioning work that we're also doing with an outside agency. And, um, then I think will also result in some, um, you know, possibly ide possibly identifying some new segments that we might end up developing new products for. But it's a little, it's, I would frame that a little bit differently. It's more of a, um, yeah, I think it's just more of a foundational piece of research that's going to influence a bunch of stuff over time. I like how you, um, it sounds like you're able to even take the output of tactical kind of, let's call them explorations, um, mm -hmm. and ladder them up to the, the strategic implications of those. Like well, that's I, something we've been trying to do. Um, you know, I know, in, uh, especially on the buyer side, Jill Fructor, who does a lot of our buyer research, she really tries to make a point of having, you know, a consistent set of um, almost kind of evergreen questions that she always asks buyers that are much more a part of this kind of ongoing longitudinal kind of study. Um, and then she'll then, you know, then shift focus to more of like the tactical product question. So we sometimes try to kind of do all those things in the same session with people. And then maybe, at, and then, so last year she did quite a bit of this. And then at the, when we started off um, a strategic planning process this year, she was able to then pull together some top line themes that really emerged out of a whole year's worth of interviews with, with buyers, um, which was really helpful. Like it helps us. I think it also, you know, I think especially on the buyer side, we're often trying to, um, understand the gap between the way we understand the way we might look at um look at events from a sort of business outcome point of view and trying to reframe that for in terms of understanding you know users expectations and um and attitude so for example we might look at you know what's happening on the on etsy in terms of like conversion rates or just gross sales you know um which is Obviously, at the end of the day, you know, what Etsy is, um, you know, what grows the business is the sellers making sales. But but from a buyer's point of view, we know from a lot of the research we've done that a lot of people relate to Etsy in kind of a different way. They relate to it more like Pinterest. It's much more of a, a source of sort of inspiration and ideas, and it's almost like entertainment for a lot of people. And so, you know, I think having that understanding and developing that understanding really helps us evolve the way we think about the product. So we're not just thinking about it in terms of this e-commerce funnel where we're just trying to convert you, you know, to buy this thing, but we really are trying to understand some of this um, softer stuff around like, you know, what, what is the job that you hired Etsy to do today? Is it, you know, and a lot of times it's about trying to like discover and um, explore and get inspired and trying to figure out how do we make sure the site is doing those things? And how could we even put some metrics around those things to make sure that we're you know, we're, we're measuring the gap between, you know, the buyer's expectation and the experience and not just looking at this in terms of, um, in terms of dollars and cents, which, you know, the hypothesis being that the sales will follow if people are happy with the experience, but, um, but trying to like, just to some extent sort of reframe the way we're thinking about the buyer experience. So it's not purely a, um, you know, and, uh, a conversion sort of conversation. 
Yeah, I like the dynamic between those and, and, and obviously having someone doing what Jill's doing where she's, even if the study is not longitudinal, she herself is living in the space for, over time and ask, meeting many people and asking many questions. and Well, exactly, which I think is really the big benefit of having an in-house research team. Um, you know, you have somebody who can really develop that sort of, uh, you know, Im implicit knowledge of things over time and just kind of live with it and become, really start to function as a user advocate in a way that I think is hard to do, you know, if you're just working with, um, you know, with vendors or, you know, consultants who come in and do a study and give you recommendations and then go on their merry way. Like, it's really, you know, the... the I think value proposition for us is we're, we're deepening our understanding over time and able to really, um, you know, be a source of insights that might not be, you know, often we can bring in an insight from another study to a particular project that might not be directly what that team thought they were looking for, but sometimes we can help them kind of shift their thinking a little bit by saying, oh, if you considered this aspect of it that, you know, came out of this thing we did three months ago that nobody's actually addressed yet, you know, so, um, so, so far, you know, I think we're making some headway, but we're still, still figuring things out too. Um, I think a lot of what we're wrestling with now is figuring out the right cadence of research. And sometimes, I mean, there is such a thing as too much research. And, you know, we've seen some teams that are really, like, really enjoying doing research and getting a lot out of it. But we're having to balance that demand with other projects, you know, and figuring out what, at what point do you, where do you reach the point of diminishing returns? At what point do you have to, like, sort of say no and move on to something else that might have more, um, you know, there might be more, uh, more juice available, you know, for another project. So that's something we're still kind of figuring out how do we prioritize things, not just in terms of, you know, relative priority of the business, but where are we going to get the most value out of research and, and where's the research team going to maybe learn or develop something. So it's not as straightforward as saying, you know, this project is more important than that project, but trying to bring in some other dimensions into that, um, you know, into that judgment as well. It's something we're still, still pondering, I guess. I can imagine that a sense of scarcity helps you with priorities. Like if we were to double the size of your team, I'm not sure that is perfect not, for you. Yeah, well, exactly, right. And we're trying to, I think one sort of mantra at Etsy right now is to try to do fewer things and do them better. I think we've been, you know, we've grown quite a bit and there's been, you know, I think certainly last year there were a lot of, you know, we were trying a lot of different things and that's, you know, has been very much the culture here of like anybody can have an idea and sort of try it out. But um, as a company gets bigger, you need to be a little more, disciplined about that. And so we're trying to really um, set our sights on what we think will be some higher value things and do, do fewer of them. And we, that obviously affects what we do from a research point of view as well. We're trying to not spread ourselves too thin, but trying to figure, find a way that we can really kind of live with a project over time and not just be kind of um, doing too much um, context switching between projects all the time. But, but that's always a, you know, a challenge because inevitably you, know, you always feel like you don't quite have enough reason. Yeah, you, it would be nice to meet the demand where it is, but um, but I think you're right. It, it, I think if we doubled the size of the research team, I'm not sure that would be in the best interest of the company. I think that might actually um, slow things down. So, I'm gonna do a little context shifting myself and ask you if there's anything uh, you know about you and your background or just your your passions that uh, you know makes you great at what you do. Ah, uh, jeez. Yeah, good question. How do, I mean, I've had a very uh, circuitous career path, I guess. I mean, I've been a, you know, today I'm a research manager. I've certainly been, worked as a researcher in the past. Um, I would say for the past, like, seven or eight years, I've been in some permutation of a research role. But, you know, before that, I was a UX designer for many years and often wore both hats then, too, like the, the design and, and research back and forth a bit. Um and then along the way, I've also been, uh, I've also been a writer. I've done a fair amount of journalism. I've um, written a couple of books on the history of the information age. And I guess if anything, if, it, if there's one sort of, I guess, maybe strength that I bring to what I do, I think a lot of what I do now is much more about uh, storytelling and trying to take insights that are coming out of studies and trying to um, make them compelling to a larger audience. So a lot of what I do, in a way, my role is almost like being an editor. Um, you know, we have a lot of researchers now generating reports and insights. And a lot of what I do is try to sort of sift through that, collate it, and um, distill that out to a, um, to a larger audience. And so I think having like, you know, background in journalism and storytelling is certainly helpful in trying to um, help sell the value of research, I guess. 
Is there anything that uh, we didn't talk about that I should have asked you about? Uh, no, I think we've covered quite a bit of ground. Nothing really comes to mind. I think we're... Any questions for me? Um, yeah. I mean, what's your... I'm curious, what, what's your take on... Um, this whole question of like qualitative and quantitative, even if we don't like those terms, like, you know, are you seeing that tension elsewhere or do you feel like it's, you know, that whole question of, is it, are they opposing camps or, you know, can they all, can they learn to play together? Like, I I feel like you talk to a lot of people out there in the the field, just curious to hear what sort of, what impressions you're getting out there from talking to people. I mean, I think it's kind of organizational culture um, and it kind of ties in with, the, you know, where does research sit piece uh-huh. and, and what's, what's research advocating for. Um, and so, you know, I think in some camps there are the skepticism that you described. Um, and I think, you know, when they become catchphrases like big data, did uh-huh. we, I think we use that already in this conversation. Those, yeah. I think those, you know, it's almost like the, the competing catchphrases, design thinking with capital letters and big data with capital letters right. that, uh, and both are kind of, um, there's an element of snake oil to each, and I don't mean what lies beneath them, but more how they're presented and more how people kind of glom onto them. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, I, I can only talk, I feel like I'm just going to throw some more cliches in. I think, you know, I like you guys are keeping it real. I mean, you're, you're, you're having conversations and you're storytelling and you're, you're, uh-huh. you're real people are talking to each other mm-hmm. um, and, you know, finding out how to pull their pieces together. And I think, that's a cultural aspect. So, you know, organization, organizations that have cultures that let people do that, where real mm-hmm. people can meet and talk about what they learn and what their questions are, seem to be more successful at pulling these pieces together and finding the gestalt between the two of them mm-hmm. um, than those that are kind of more territorial and that have the research department. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, yeah, that's, that's my take yes. on it. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. It's funny, I, you may or may not know, it's, Etsy's sort of corporate motto is keep it real. So. Ah. <laughs> what it's worth. Okay, good. Oh, that's what we try to do. <laughs> well, this has been uh, really interesting and uh, really inspiring, and I just want to thank you, Alex. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me and taking all this time. I definitely enjoyed the conversation. We'll stay in touch. So. All right, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dollars to Donuts. And thank you to everyone that helped me put this together. You can get links about this episode, listen to other episodes, subscribe to the podcast, and read the transcripts at portugal.com slash series slash dollars to donuts. You can buy my book, Interviewing Users, from Amazon or from Rosenfeld Media. Get in touch with me at portugal.com to start exploring how we can work together.